This is the Freedom Fiends. And this is going to be a little bit different show than the usual format they're used to. Paul and I, we're, we're doing a little something different. We, we've been talking about this little project for a little while. And so we're, we're just kind of busting it out gangster gorilla style. So uh, gangster podcast, gorilla, something. I don't know. But anyway, uh, gangster, yeah, we're going to like school. That. Yeah. OG. We're not, wait, we're not going to do the Freedom Fiends intro, you know, the podcast 2A, whatever. You know what? Do that? <laughs> I I actually have to read that thing. I don't have it memorized. <laughs> I don't have it I, memorized. I, 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 I hear I it for, enough. I I'm such a bad 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 human uh, and fiend and and everything else. I and I'm just I'm a horrible person. I'm I'm like the Larry of the Freedom Fiends. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my daughter. I I apologize for this, everyone, and all. All the fiend people out there, I apologize for this. I listen to Freedom Fiends just about every morning when it's on. And uh, I don't listen to it live. I listen to the archive the next morning. It's the breakfast time. And I get up and I play Freedom Fiends. And you hear the music and the introduction. Freedom Fiends broadcasting. Pod pod A, 2A, whatever. Locus yeah, Surrealis. You can't even remember it. <laughs> all that. Can you feel it, Lou? Can you feel it? Uh and my daughter associates all of that with school, with getting up in the morning and having to go to school. So I've done that. I didn't mean to, but there you have it. When she hears the freedom theme music, she automatically thinks, oh, it's time to go to school. Well, to, tonight's episode, this, this episode that we're doing right now today, is part of the Freedom Fiends Distance Learning Program. The Freedom what? Fiends Distance Learning Program. Wow. I'd never heard of this program. <laughs> this actually goes back to some of the original fiends. We're talking OF gangster stuff here. We're going, we're going OG, going folks. Back. Yeah, we're, we're going back to even before the LRN days. That's how far back it's going. So this is like uh, uh, Nima Vidati days or thereabouts? This or? is Michael and Nima doing separate audio files emailing them to each other and sewing <laughs> together. I heard about that. That's incredible. They each uh, recorded their version, their track, and then they had to piece it together like some mad jigsaw puzzle. That's that's crazy. That's that's a lot yeah. of dedication to your craft when you do that. So we're, we're, we're not going to be going with that technologically. That's good. Uh, backwards. Well, it's not exact, not exactly backwards technology. It's primitive. We're not going to be going as primitive as back then, but we are going to be in that format where we're just going to banter for a bunch of time and and stuff's going to get thrown together. So anyway, th this project that you and I have been talking about for a little while, this is a subject matter that you spoke on at the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest last year. I did uh, for 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 2017. So fifth annual Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to to catch your presentation because I was doing a bunch of interviews at the time. Uh, I didn't get a chance to, to listen to any of the speakers because I was so busy interviewing them when they got done. <laughs> you even <laughs> interviewed me, as a matter of fact. I yeah, was one of the speakers yeah. you interviewed. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd miss their presentation, sit them down to interview them, say, okay, so what did you talk about? They're like, you weren't there? No, I was interviewing the person that was on before you. Oh, okay. So, But anyway, so we're going to be talking today about the – Reality of power, and are, are we also going to be throwing some of the the nature of power in there? No, it's all about the reality of power. You tell me okay. about the nature of power. You could throw that in. Okay. Well, we'll see how that goes as as, as time marches on. So, alrighty. Uh, well, let's get started then. I'm ready. I'm prepared. Okay. I've written so copious notes and. <laughs> Uh, do, do you just want me to, to start off with my, I mean, the starting point for me is uh, knowing. Standing on your preferences? Yeah, standing on your preferences, exactly. Knowing what your preferences are. Even though you, you can't fully know exactly what your preferences are, you, you kind of get a little bit closer to it. And the closer you are to understanding your preferences, the closer you are to understanding who and what you really are. And this is the version of you that's been stripped of all the, all the mythology, whatever mythology that you're attached to that 
allowed you to hide from yourself, you, you kind of strip all that stuff away. So my starting point was, well, what are my preferences? What are my core preferences? And, you know, the when we're talking about how I view community, what I came to understand the most essential core preference at play is I want to live in a situation in which I have the least amount of threat of force, of physical force or, or actual application of force influencing my choice as to how I'm going to decide to take an action. So that was my first step. Okay, great. I'm standing on this preference. I prefer to have the least amount of force applied to me or are threatened against me. And then when I when I got to that point, then the next step was okay, there's the way that I thought about it, and you can you can correct me if you think I'm wrong. I thought there's two paths. There was this one path which is I am a superhero and I don't have to worry about threats. I could do whatever I want, even if it produces a, a physical response. I don't have to worry about it. But I don't know so if is you that know this. Of, so is that kind of like having a magic costume and a shiny badge? It is, actually. It it absolutely is. It's uh yeah, I I I could choose the superhero path and 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 that that that's a possible path. I decided I don't really have that super superhero power. I don't think that I can meet every potential force against me. And so I came to another conclusion, which is it is in my best interest as far as meeting my preferences to seeing a community around me in which individuals, well, I'm, I'm associating with individuals who have that shared core preference. They would prefer to not have physical force uh, impede their progress, at least, you know, as as least as possible. I mean, you know, a hurricane is a threat of force, so you're never going to totally get rid of that. But you're you're trying to reduce that threat as much as possible, and so and hurricanes, <laughs> yeah. So only the police, only the police and military should have hurricanes. Uh, you know that's, you know that's going to be my slogan when I don't run in twenty twenty. Take away the hurricanes now. Worry about due process later. Ban assault hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and no Hispanic names. Yeah, because that's racist. So I, yeah, I, I came to the conclusion that it's in my best interest to be surrounded by people who have not only that core preference, but they have some degree of ability to be able to meet a threat, a physical threat, uh, to, to, I'll say, increase the cost of someone else carrying out that physical threat. And the cost if you, of coercion. Yeah, the, ra raising the cost of coercion, exactly. So if, if you're part of an association of like-minded people, that increases your ability as a group to counter the threat from folks who think they're very differently. So this sounds uh, this sounds a lot like uh, Frederick Bastiat in the law, where he says that each person has the right to defend their life, liberty, and property. And if they have the right as individuals to do that, then they have the right to collectively organize as a group to do it. And I don't use the word right. <laughs> I try to avoid the word right. I'm not going to argue whether rights are real or whether they're not real. I kind of view rights as one of those uh, ghosts that hide you from yourself. That to, the only to, rights you have are the ones that you can defend. That's it. That's right. And this is where we get to the to the reality of power. You know the anarchist axiom, which is own yourself. Now. I say own your preferences, stand nakedly on them, become self-aware of what you want, give yourself a chance to change if you don't like the answers. And if you like the answers, then become self-aware regarding what stands in your way, what opportunities exist to increase your opportunity to fulfill your preference, 
and what stands in your way. And then from this, I get to the, to the next point. And that means you have to understand the reality of power around you. So then the big question is, well, what is power? I mean, what's your definition of power? Oh gosh, that's probably uh, that. That's that's really a tough one to really come up with most off people, the cuff. Um, most people are not trying to define what power is. Yeah, no, no, they're not. Uh, I would have to say uh, the ability to impose your will upon others, but it, it could also be the ability to repel the will of others to defend but, against the imposition. So it's interesting what you said. What you said was you went right to the negative. And I don't think that's accidental. Most people, when they think power, they think negative. Power is, you know, I mean, Lord Acton, power corrupts absolute power corrupts absolutely. And there's a lot of truth to that, but I don't know how he's defining power, but his and definition he, he, seems to be a negative one. Yeah, in the yeah in the full quote, he is very critical of those that would seek power. Uh, and I can't remember who it was. Uh, uh, Maybe in uh, oh gosh, I can't remember his name. I think the guy that uh, wrote Dune uh, said that uh, uh, people that seek or power is magnetic to the corruptible. And again, that's that word power. It has this negative connotation. It does not have a negative connotation for me. Not my Now, my definition of power, I want to make it clear that I'm not at all suggesting that Paul's definition of power is the definition of power that I've come up with. The, this is within the framework of my understanding what I call the reality of power. This is, this is where I'm working in. This is the sphere that I'm working in. So to me, power is simply the ability to act and the ability to influence the action of others. That's it. It's neither good nor bad. It's neutral. It is. It's like a scientific observation. The ability to act is power. The ability to influence action is power. So that was my starting point. Cell 411 is a great free app for Android and iPhone. It allows you to set up public and private cells for dealing with crime, emergencies, setting up neighborhood watch, activism, and even protecting your kids from bullies on the street or at school. Cell 411 gives your cells turn-by-turn -turn directions to your location with one touch on your phone. There is also a Bluetooth panic button available that can be worn on your wrist, belt, or around your neck. Cell 411 has real-time chat for each alert so you can discuss the incident with family or friends in real-time video streaming. The video is stored on Cell 411's servers so your evidence cannot be deleted if your phone is taken or destroyed. Cell 411 has decentralized ride-sharing that allows for payment in any form – crypto, barter, silver, cash, etc. Cell 411 does not take a cut of your fare. Get Cell 411 free on Google Play and the iTunes Store. Or go to GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com. I do think that a lot of people pick up on the negative connotation of it because that's that's how it's used. Um, always. Well, almost yeah. always. Yeah. Every once in a while, uh, it's fight the power or, you know, power of the people. Sometimes power of the people is, is used power, you know, uh, uh, optimus, I mean, uh, in, a, in a positive way. <laughs> but mostly power... Power is evil. It's like yeah. And, there's there's not a single election season that doesn't come around where people aren't talking about how they want to impose their will upon their neighbors and loot and pillage them and force them to pay for all this other stuff, all the stuff that they want, their preferences, as you had mentioned earlier. And then you have the other side of the coin where people want to avoid having the other people's preferences imposed upon them and want to impose theirs. Uh, so you got everybody saying, you know, health care is a right. Education is a right. Walls are a right. Militarism is a right. You know, just all these different bunches of socialists with their own little preference for the, the free stuff or forcing everybody to pay for it. And it's hidden. Their naked power is hidden behind some sort of mythological idealism that allows them not to face the nakedness of who and what they really are. The okay. gun grabbers. They, we as a society. We as a society. 
Right. Oh, I hate, I hate that phrase. But it's oh, it's God. one of those. It's again. It's 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 one of those 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 uh, ideological curtains. You're 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 you know the in the Wizard of Oz. You're the wizard, and the curtain are the ideals that you hide behind. I'm not saying that you don't have ideals. I'm saying that often, rather than following ideals, the ideals have been shaped to justify you doing bad things to other people. That's often the case. Like the the the, the gun grabber folks, they what 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 is I mean, they all have I don't want to say everybody is the same, everybody thinks the same way, but a, a large portion of these folks, these folks are just fearful and they have been conditioned to believe that the only legitimate source for protection is is this nameless authority that removes responsibility from themselves. So they're, they 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 need you to not have guns, I believe, in large part because then it helps them to uh to accept their dependence on the state and now you're just like them and they want to make sure yeah. that you're just like them if it's kind of like you don't want to be around when you quit smoking and you don't want to be around smokers you know <laughs> that's so I, I, I went through that I, i'm a little bit over two years right now in the, fr the first month or two i didn't go near smokers after that i wasn't so bad about it but or, or uh, actually to, to kind of, sorry to kind of ahead. piggyback on to kind of piggyback on what you were talking about uh they have this ideology, uh, but also it's it's more conditioned. It's, it's very Pavlovian uh, to where if if a libertarian type, even a political libertarian type, says we have to shrink the size of government, then the then the question will be, but who will build the roads? Do you want children to be illiterate? Yeah, all these different things. And these are conditioned responses because they're not responses that are well thought out. They're not thought out at all. They're not based upon reason. Uh, they're not even questioned as in, well, gee, who would build the roads? Oh, well, maybe it's some of the same people. Maybe road builders would build it. How would the roads be paid for? Huh, how were they paid for before the government started doing it? And they they don't look at these things. Or if you look at uh, if you look at education, uh I know that you've read a, a lot of stuff from the 1800s and 1700s, uh, probably even early the early 20th century magazine articles. And if you if you look at the language that is in these in these uh, magazine articles, it, and we're not talking about scholarly journals, we're talking about regular magazine articles. It makes the intellectuals of today seem like simpletons. Yeah. So the question, and and, and that was before you had the compulsory public education. You had small towns would get together and they would have they would have a schoolhouse and they'd hire a school teacher and you'd have literally the one room schoolhouse uh, for the kids that could get in there. A lot of people learned at at home. Uh, one of the main reasons for learning to read and write was for studying the Bible. Now, so you had education, and and people are of the mind. Uh, I, I know you've seen this meme or, or at least heard the thought before that if uh, that if uh, babies were taken away from their parents shortly after birth and put into infant training camps uh, within a generation there would be most of the people would believe that no baby ever learned to walk and talk on its own yeah without a government without a right. without a government program yeah but I will I'm gonna go back to what you said where you're you know they're they're not thinking. I think they are. Well, well, it's not all of them, but many of them are. They're just not in touch with what's at the root of their thinking. When I think it's Pavlovian, I, I seriously do. I I think that it's, it's you know it, to some degree it's Pavlovian, and I think to some degree it's 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 what I was saying from the beginning. It's they've invented certain, and the, these are almost like like uh, like totems or something. This just just this 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 symbolism that cuts off your critical thinking and you want it to see that's the thing you want it to because you don't want to face yourself you don't want to face the fact that the real reason that you cannot let go of the coercive enterprise model in your head
is because at the end of the day, you can't imagine having to deal with naked, uh, unrestricted, unregulated competition. You want to live in a world in which you imagine that you can use coercion against your neighbor to assure that you don't have to fully compete with your neighbor. And I, I mean, I don't know the degree to which that's conditioned or I, I think some of it is conditioned. I think some of the conditioning is it's kind of like this is a part of it is a part of human nature to want to avoid competition. So it's kind of a conditioning that's easy to create among humans because they they have this tendency in them, which is you know, it, it's also an option, though. How do you mean? Be, because with the coercive enterprise being able to stifle competition in that regard, uh, people have something that they can fall back on. They can they can invoke the anti dog eat dog rule and stop competition. They Reed, can, they can man, use great. But no, they but, can, yeah, they, they're they, not they stopping. Can use, yeah, they're stopping competition exactly. Yeah, but they're using. But, but here's the thing. Yeah, but but when you make laziness into a viable option. Uh, or if you make bad behavior into a viable option, you really shouldn't be surprised when people choose those options because they are available. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I don't understand it. You know, these people, they used to be so industrious and, and then we started giving them all this free stuff and they stopped being industrious. Yeah. That's weird. Or, or if you go with the Forrest Gump version of history of, the U.S. government was just minding its own business, making drugs illegal, and for no reason whatsoever, those cartels popped up and started having wars for territory. Yeah, that just came out of nowhere. It wasn't a condition that the U.S. government created. It totally did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I, it, it, it wasn't a well-demonstrated uh, hi historical uh, occurrence happening several times over every time every time uh, a, a new prohibition was put in place uh, it's, it's, it's not like they didn't have anything to look at a couple of years ago like the prohibition of alcohol or any other prohibitions throughout history I mean, heaven forbid so obviously for me living in this world where i'm surrounded by neighbors that i i, I don't I don't really, you know, they say voting is violence. I don't think voting is violence because I don't think voting really does anything. But I do think that there is a violent intent to voting, whether it's actually effective or not. I don't think it really is. But, uh, you know, to know that your neighbors, that they, that this is acceptable behavior to them, that it's perfectly fine to go to the ballot and put a piece of paper in or pull a lever that triggers somebody in some office miles and miles away to write something on a piece of paper that sends out people with guns to stop people from doing things that are not directly harming others. The, that, that bothers me to know that I live in that world. And so I wanted to understand the reality of power. What can I do? i I'm somewhat of a sophist in how I live my life. Like I don't I don't have to believe that I can win to try. I know that I have certain areas of my life where I have control, uh relatively speaking. And in those areas in my life I want to maximize my control, be excellent in those areas. So I want to understand the reality of power, and once I understand the reality of power to the best of my ability based on the information and the skill sets that I have, how can I maximize my efforts to tilt the balance of power away from the course of enterprise and towards free associations and individuals? And to that end, I have identified what I think and this is totally subject to change, although I've, I've had this for about a, a little bit over a year now. And so far, I, I write on iState.tv. Can I mention iState.tv on Freedom Fiends? Is that all right? You better. I, okay. I, I mentioned <laughs> you it have, all the time. You've mentioned it, yes. So I, 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 I take news articles. I analyze them. I take stories. And I'm analyzing them, and I'm looking at them from this framework, from – my understanding of the reality of power, and I believe that there are four major spheres of influence uh, uh, when it comes to the reality of power. There's 
ideational influence, that's rule of law is ideational influence. Very powerful. Rule of law does have some power, but it's not total power. There's uh, social influence, and social influences is both bad and good. It's a reward, and it's a scorning. And there's uh, demonstrable influence, and actually, I, I, I don't hopefully we'll get to it but i actually think this is the area where we have the most hope to advance the to, to tilt the balance of power towards individuals and free associations demonstrable influence is actually showing people that you can provide products and services that you can have community that you can meet one another's needs without relying on a coercive enterprise model and i think that's going to be the most powerful initially the most powerful sphere of influence that we can operate it and then there's the last one which is force influence and there's aggressive force and defensive force and so when i look at the world that's how i break everything down i'm looking and almost everything is a bit of a hybrid it's a little bit it's not like oh it's all ideational it's all demonstrable there's 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 hybrids there so I don't know if you want me to continue or if you have a question there for me, but I do have examples. Uh, go ahead with the examples. I'm, I'm rather intrigued by this, and uh, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing the demonstrable because that's probably the 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 one thing that I focus on the most in my in my daily life and uh, with uh, radio and podcasting and and everything else. Uh, I, I don't consider myself an activist in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I, I've, I've come to loathe that word uh, because most people, their activists are they're they're not really trying to get freedom; they're trying to get permission. Uh, right. I won't say but, all activists are that, but a large chunk, yes. Yeah, yeah. Or the hashtag "Please donate" crowd, but the uh, <laughs> although please donate. <laughs> yeah. I I I, I guess. Uh, I, I don't look at uh, I don't look at liberty as a as an end result. I don't look at it as something to strive for. I look at it as something to have right now. Uh, a lot of people are, are of the mind, and particularly the the ones that are looking for political liberty. Uh, they will say, "Well, I can't be free until everybody else agrees to be free." And if you wait for everybody else to be free, then you're never going to be free. Or I, I can't be free until until you know the the, the Congress votes to make me free. Or you get the guy who says, but if the government collapses, then who's going to defend my Second Amendment and renew my permit to carry? See, I use the word liberty various times because it's convenient. And I think, especially to some of the crowds I talk to, I think they understand it more or less how I do. It's not always the case. But I, I don't need the word liberty. Uh, for me, I, I can strip things down to the reality of power. I want something. And in order for me to have it, I have to have the power to hold on to it. And I need to find people that want a similar thing to me. Whatever you want to call it, I don't care. Liberty isn't going to stop somebody from passing a law that uh, rains taxes down upon my head. But them understanding that if they try to collect, it's not going to be collectible, that's going to be far more effective, whatever you want to call it. So. Right. <laughs> so I don't I, use the word liberty it, all that much anymore. It, it, if, if I could uh, – hmm, how could I put it? If I could get uh, a little bit on the subversive side here, uh, it's – you have a better chance of of being free not because, not because uh, you got permission but because you have made – coercion unenforceable you have yes. raised the you have raised the cost of coercion to a point that uh, they will never get more out of you than they have to expend or they will never get anything out of you you've taken away the profit incentive <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's what yeah. it boils down to so yeah. when, when then does plunder end plunder ends when it's more painful to plunder than it is to labor that's it. That's Bastia. You know, and I'm sure that you see a lot of Bastia in my thoughts here. You know, uh, yes, I, yes. Um, so I'll get to the ideational example here. And what, what I've done here is I've just given how 
ideation. In this case, we're going to be talking about a situation in which one group had a decided uh, advantage in, in all the spheres of influence except for ideational. They had social influence. They had force influence. They had demonstrable influence. And I can't really in this show go into the full explanation of why that is. So you'll just have to take my word for it. The sixth annual Midwest Peace of Liberty Fest will be held at the Circle Pine Center in Delton, Michigan, just outside of Kalamazoo, from Thursday, June 21st through Monday, June 25th. There will be all sorts of activities in a family and adult-friendly environment. Scheduled speakers include Dana Martin, Brett Vinat, Prof. CJ, and Scott Horton. Round up your friends and family members and get them registered today at mplfest.org. That's Mike, Papa, Lima, Fest. Dot org. Dogs welcome. Longer leashes recommended. When I'm talking about the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, and there's one moment in the Peasants' Revolt that really crystallized the power of ideational influence. So after the peasants had revolted because there was a poll tax, they marched on London, and they, they did all kinds of terrible things. I don't know if I'd call it terrible, but uh, uh, they they finally they confronted the king on Smithfield. This is King Richard II on Smithfield. Did they loot the cell phone store? Did they get some new sneakers <laughs> and flat screens? Yeah, they did. And they said, down with Peasant capitalism. Li <laughs> Peasant lives matter. Peasant yeah. lives matter. They didn't, they didn't quite do that. Actually, they did controlled looting. They only looted... Uh, targeted people, people that they viewed as being part of the of the problem. Uh, so on one side of the field, you had 200 armed men, and this was the king's men, and and these were the knights. On the other side, you had 300 to 400 men, and they were armed with the English longbow. And... Uh, if you know anything about the English longbow, you know the English longbow versus knights. It's not good for the knights. It it pretty much ended chivalry. So at this showdown, the Tyler Watt, he was the leader of the group. He approaches the king, and there are words, there are agreements that are made. And uh, now Tyler Watt, in interestingly, Tyler Watt was not vulnerable to the ideational power of the king. Tyler Watt had another ideational power or ideational influence in his head that overrode the ideational influence of the time. And that ideational influence, by the way, is the divine rule of kings. His was a line from a poem by John Ball, which was, When Adam delved and Eve span, who was first the gentleman. Well, that, that shot the whole idea of nobility in his head. But, but he was a tiny minority among the group. That wasn't how everybody else thought. So there was like a fluffle. What, what happened? Who did what? What Tyler ends up killed. And now what Tyler's men, they're ticked. They're ready. They're ready to wipe people out. And the king rides out. You, you have your finger up? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it sounds a lot like, uh, it sounds like a, a a lot like the the modern patriot that the says we have to we have to rebel against this government and restore the constitution. Um, is it sounds like the average person was like that the the patriot that says we're going to get rid of that tyrant we're going to get ourselves a new tyrant and, and it sounds like Tyler Watt was like maybe we don't need tyrants period. Well. Almost as as, a, as as a comparison, he didn't Almost. buy into the divine. He didn't buy into the divine right of kings. And, and he quite rejected frankly, that. Yeah, the, I, the the divine right of kings has has changed from kings to the divine right of uh, of presidents and congressmen. Actually, I would argue that it's changed to the divine right of rule of law. Uh, that's replaced. The, the 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 presidents and the congressmen derive their divinity and their authority from the myth of the rule of law, but they weren't quite like the Patriots. They were not trying to get rid of the King. Actually, all they really wanted to get rid of was all the King's men. They didn't want to lay a finger on the King. That wasn't his, their problem. He was a 13 year old boy. They, 
just wanted to get rid of They blame, they put all the blame on his henchmen, on his administrators. So that, that's a very old story, by the way. <laughs> one that's been repeated several times. Are you familiar with the Olive Branch petition? During no. the, it, it was, it was just before the war for American independence started. Okay. The notion was the King's a good guy. He's getting bad advice from all these people. Uh, if only he knew what was going on here in the colonies, uh, then he would Same see that, par- that parliament's yep. just, they're, they're, they're being bad. They're, they're overstepping their bounds. And if the King knew what, what they were truly doing, then he would step in and he would stop all this stuff. And so they wrote what was called the Olive Branch Petition where they said, hey, you know, these are the things that we would like to have taken care of. And uh, if, if this is done, we'll go back to being good, obedient uh, British subjects. And they figured the king was going to be like, oh, well, I'm going to have to reign in this parliament. My my, my subjects over in the Americas, they, they, they want to behave. Uh, but instead, he did not reign in parliament. Um, he did not say, well, good for, good for those chaps. No, he sent Hessians instead. <laughs> and this is. Yeah, well, and, and, and and this this thought of well, it's not the king; it's it's all the king's men. It's it's Humpty Dumpty. It's it's whoever it is that's screwing everything up. But if the king knew, so we're not going to worry about the king. We're going to worry about the court. So the, and so, this, so, but still, they were ticked and they were yeah. ready to unleash fury. And what happens? The king rides out on his horse just. Rides out to them, thirteen-year-old boy, on his pony, <laughs> on his, on his, on his pony, and all he says to them is, "You shall have no other king but me." And everybody left. He had made promises, you know. He had made promises earlier. He'd signed a declaration. He was going to do all these kind of like, you know, oh, King George is going to do this. He's going to do that, uh, and he did all that. And uh, shortly afterwards, like immediately afterwards, once once the threat of force had dissipated, and the the force threat had had scattered throughout the lands, and people were no longer assembled, then they went through selectively the first thing they did, and they proceeded to execute all of the leaders. Now, Watt Tyler was already dead. John Ball would be killed, and many of the other leaders would be killed. And they went through a process over the next couple of so years, and there were some little, still some little skirmishes here and there, but by and large, it was over at that moment, and it was all over ideational influence. So ideational influence is powerful. So even when I say, I think demonstrable influence is our, our that's, I, I call it the lowest hanging fruit. If at some point the ideational influence doesn't shift, you can have all of the advantages and dis- demonstrable power, social uh, or demonstrable influence, social influence, and uh, even force influence. But if you don't have that ideational influence, that that thing will take you out, like like it di- like it did in this case. Uh, and you know it's interesting. You you hadn't read this, and I didn't include this in the notes when you talked about how the, sh- the you know it's shifted now. Now we we still have the divine right. It's just not the divine right of kings. And I I covered that in in I'm working on a documentary. I'm going to do it someday <laughs> on the on the peasants' revolt of 1381 because there's so many things about the peasants' revolt of 1381 that really there there's these perfect opportunities to illustrate. Whoop, to illustrate the reality of power. Sorry about that. I tilt, tipped my microphone there. Got a little excited. Uh, we, we're, we're, it looks like we got about two minutes or so left before we go to break. Do I, I, I could get to the social example or maybe wait to the other side of the break, but, but that's where I'm going next is the social influence. Okay, so, so let's summarize the meaning of the ideation. And go over that one more time and, and just put it bare bones, plain and simple, so that people like me can understand and so, how it's going to impact things. Okay, so power. Power is simply the ability 
to take action or influence the action of others. And you do that in four major spheres. The ideational sphere. These are ideas. A lot of them are mythologies, ideologies. Belief systems. Belief systems. Uh, uh, social. Uh, well, let, let, let's stick with the ideation for the rest of this. Uh, what do you see as being the best possibility to change the belief system that the coercive enterprise must exist? I believe that the first step is to demonstrate that you can have this. And then the, the once people start experiencing this alternative way, uh, you know, this non-coercive way of living, then you can have more standing with them to be able to talk to them about Bastia and to talk to them about Spooner. And they're, they're going to be open to hearing these ideas because they're not going to so fundamentally challenge their identity. I think I hear the music uh, coming in here. We're just about ready to, I think you hear that music. I can't hear anything. You but. can't hear anything. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, I, I, I'll, I'll just take a side. I, what I see or what I'm hearing from you is that it's going to be a market-based thing. Uh, the, the product of government is going to get replaced by the product of the market, and it's going to outcompete government eventually. And when it gets to the point that people have accepted the market over government for their solutions, then government is going to wither away and die. It's it's, it's going to become like MySpace. A, a few billion people might have accounts, but they haven't logged in in years. And this is the Freedom Fiends. Yay! This is Lou, and I am joined by Paul Gordon, and we are doing the Freedom Fiends Distance Learning Program here, where you can... Well Welcome. Get your get your homeschool and get your home education on the radio, or get your or the podcast. Yeah, we're we're unschooling you. Yeah, we're unschooling so. you. You need some unschooling. Get the kids cuddled up around the microphone or the speaker or whatever, and uh, get them to listen to the sweet dulcet tones of Lou <laughs> with so, Paul yeah, accompaniment. We, yeah. <laughs> So this is old school guerrilla podcasting, just like the old days, and we're, we're dropping mad scientists here. And the, the subject today is the reality of power and four spheres of influence. So if you miss the first hour, we spoke about the sphere of ideation, meaning the belief system, the ideology ideational that supports power. power. Yeah. yeah, ideational influence, yes. Yeah, it, it, it supports the existence of power. It's it's the faith in the religion of statism. Or so, whatever. It's not necessarily just, yeah. I mean, we all have, I mean, actually the idea that the coercive enterprise is bad because it will ruthlessly destroy lives. And if you need proof of this, go watch the, the documentary series called The 14 Diaries of the Great War. Once you get to episode six, seven, and eight, you really start to understand the brutality. I mean, that's an ideational power. It's 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 not necessarily a bad thing. It's it can be good. In this case, subjectively so. That's that's a good idea to to get the idea in people's heads. You know, there is a there's another way. There's a nonviolent, relatively speaking, nonviolent way. But look, we've been butchering each other since the beginning of time. You can't, right. you, you don't change horses in mid race. <laughs> I, I, I did a story on headlines you may have missed. It's a podcast I do uh, Vod, Monday through Thursday. Uh, video cast, so vodcast, yeah. It's a vodcast, yeah. Headlines vod, you may yeah. have missed. Anyway, and, well, one of the stories was they discovered the the earliest traces of light. So the theory is that after the Big Bang Theory, there was a period of darkness that lasted 180 million years. And I said in the podcast, uh, or podcast, I said, imagine if you lived, theoretically, if you could, if you lived during that dark age, you were 90 million years into nothing but darkness. And then somebody came up to you and said, Dude, I have this thought. I think there should be, there could be something called light. And they describe it to you. You think they're nuts. 
I, I think that's kind of who we are. Okay, yeah, you, it, you, you feel like this is the way it is, was, and always will be, but not necessarily. It's not necessarily true that this is the way things always have to be. You might be in the middle of that, 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 that dark age. I think that in that metaphor that we're not at 90 million years, we're at 179.999999 years. The light is just upon us real soon. Wow. That's yeah, inspirational. Isn't it? So, yeah. So, so, do you, so do you think people will be able to, to go from putting their hands out in front of them and hoping they don't go bumping into stuff in the dark to actually having light? No, what they'll do initially is they'll close their eyes. Oh, absolutely not! Not, not because uh, not because the light is so bright. It, it, it's kind of like in that movie, uh, The Matrix, when uh, when Neo says, oh, "My muscles hurt. I've I've never used them. Why why are my eyes so sore? Well, you never use those either. Why is yeah. my brain Why is my brain hurt? Well, you've never used that either. So, <laughs> but anyway, right. yeah. So so I guess. Let, Let's let's Go get ahead. back into the reality power and the other three ideation or the other three uh, spheres of influence uh, because it's really really interesting. I know we're gonna have a hard time getting through all of them, uh, particularly with demonstration or demonstra- demonstrable demonstration yeah. de- demonstrable. Yeah, so yeah, that that's that's, that's one I'm really excited twister. to hear about. So uh, let, let's go to the next one. The social. Second. So the other one is social influence. So there's social shaming. And then there's social reward, and there's gradations, to be sure. Everything that I'm describing, there's gradations, there's hybrids. Uh, Very rarely you're going to see something that neatly fits into one category. But for for the purposes of simplicity, uh, social shaming. So I'll give you the social shaming example. It's a recent one. And this is this is the tactic that's being deployed, and I'm actually trying to do a counter tactic on this. Uh, and that is, after the Florida shooting, you had what did they do? They called out a bunch of kids, and they playing on your heartstrings, and they're you know they these kids you know they're survivors they're survivors of a of a brutal thing. You can't you can't possibly like come up against them and say words against them that's so gauche that's so beyond the pale why would you that's that's disgusting why would you do that what do you are you are you a are you against protecting kids is it is holding on to that ar-15 so important to you that that you would willingly risk the lives of children that's social shaming that they're applying and they're trying the divine, the divine right of kids Yes, the divine right of case. They're trying to create an environment in which the tools of self-defense themselves are viewed as being vile. They're like they're like child. Well, I won't. They're they're, they're vulgar images in and of themselves. Uh, my daughter told the story uh, a couple of years ago in school. Teacher was reading something from a newspaper, and there happened to be a picture of a gun. Now, fortunately, it was only half the class. Half the class shrieked at the sight of that gun. That's social shaming. That's what they're doing. So I've been countering. And and again, within my stoics perspective, do I really think it'll make a difference? Really counter? I don't know. But you know what? I have this fear uh, where I actually have some control. And so whenever I run across the gun grabber, I am sure to throw social shaming back at them. I want them to feel humiliated. I want them to feel totally uh, worthless. Like, why would you possibly want to empower a police state? Do you know how that ends? That ends with millions and millions upon millions dead. I'm not really fighting with them ideationally. I'm trying to socially shame them. That's it. I'm just trying to make them feel like they're trying to make people who just want the tools of self-defense to feel. So that's yeah. the social shaming. Now I'm going to get the social liter- reward. Trump Trump is literally Hitler, and Hitler has to disarm the entire civilian population. That's the argument of a lot of these people. Well, it's we love children and you hate them, and if you hate children, then you shouldn't even be considered you know, decent. That's why, you know, the, these, these companies now, they're, they're, 
they're they're following suit. You know, with their, we're not going to sell AR-15s. We're only going to sell the twenty-year-olds. They're 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 trying to contribute to this culture of of shaming for people who want to have the tools of self-defense. On the other side of that is social reward. And I got a, a, another recent example. Well, it's an ongoing example that was kind of upset recently by knees. Uh, and that is the massive displays of patriotism at football games in which what a football game in America, that football is, I mean, I, you guys can't see it, but right now I'm sitting here doing the show wearing an Eagles shirt. And yes, I am an Eagles fan. I admit it. Uh, but there's I don't. No buy- other, there's no legitimate reason to wear an Eagles shirt if you're not. <laughs> That's true. Or, or unless you just don't care and you're just grabbing whatever shirt. You're just so cool you don't care. Uh, you're but almost I don't buy- at the Goodwill. <laughs> or that, yeah. So I don't buy into this. You know, I, I, I try to turn on the football game after the parades are over because I can't stand watching them. So the massive displays of patriotism at the most, it's the most popular sport. And the NFL, it's the most popular league. And it gives this massive platform of, of this overt display of patriotism with thousands upon thousands of people sing along to the Pledge of Allegiance. They hold their hands over their heart. They get moist eyes and they cheer vociferously. That is that is the social reward. Love the state, salute the flag, be part of the team, and you will be loved. You will be appreciated. Thousands upon thousands of fans can cheer for you. That's social reward. Most most religions prohibit idolatry. Statism requires it. Right. And you you and I talked about this on our on our Thursday night show, the Is Daily Thursday night. And it was the short release section and talking about um people com- comments on a, on an article about a kid not standing up for the pledge of allegiance. And the oh. the comments on there were just unbelievable. Horrible. I mean, I mean, one person was saying, "Yeah, even the Jehovah's Witnesses felt the pressure to to stand up and participate." And for the, for those of you that aren't familiar with Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't celebrate holidays, they don't do birthdays, uh, they don't do uh, pledges of allegiance. They view that as idolatry. The second commandment: uh, "Thou shalt not form, create, and worship false gods and idols." And when when you're when you're having this religious uh, experience of of uh, pledging allegiance to the the idol of the state and 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 singing along with the with the government's theme song, you are engaging in idolatry. And you can say, "Oh, it's not an idol; it's a symbol." You know, it, it's a symbol of of our of our republic, the government. It's it's a symbol of our freedom that's disappearing. It's a symbol of this, and and we're just showing love, respect, reverence. And if some dirty hippie burns my burns our symbol then we're going to declare a fatwa calling for his head and have him executed we live in a land where if you happen to have a lot of money on you and a cop pulls you over he can take your money from you no due process yeah freedom disappearing hmm I don't know if I'd call it disappearing. I don't even know if, if freedom is and a real it's thing, gone. But it's and gone. it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> well, yeah. little, 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 well, well, we well, live in the land of yeah. the free, and it's gone. Yeah, that was well. People people are more reference. concerned with the symbol of freedom than they are with the actual freedom. And you're absolutely I, the, right. Those absolutely. comments. Those comments on that article were unbelievable. I mean, it's it's really. <laughs> I I, I I almost got cancer reading them. She anyway. should have, she should get teacher of the year award for what she did. She pulled oh, a yeah, kid, yeah. ripped yeah, him up snatched, by his arm. Yeah. And she should get teacher of the year for that. Yeah. So but anyway, uh, uh, let's get back on topic because, uh, well, I got one more thing. Uh, for, for the people that freak out over their taking the knee and everything, if you're tired of athletes taking a knee, here's a simple solution. Quit pledging allegiance to the government's flag and singing the government's theme song at sporting events. If you want to worship the government's flag, go to the IRS building and do it. 
Yeah. That's, I mean, there's got to be an IRS building near you. Just go Separation of sports, ball, and state. So anyway, I uh, go, going going back to the to the reward and punishment thing. Uh, we're done with that. We're okay. we're gonna we're gonna hit force influence now. Are you okay. ready? I'm ready. So force influence. I use the Christmas truce of 1914 as my example. Uh, the Christmas truce. It. I mean, I. There's conflicting reports about how it happened, but generally speaking. These dudes, they they were really close to each other. Uh, you know, they were just a few yards away, and and they began to talk to each other, and they they began to become real to each other, and they began to not want to get killed, and they began to not see the point of why they were getting killed, and so, the Christmas truce comes about, and uh, uh, December twenty fifth. 1914 German and and British troops come out and they exchange gifts they have they they have dinners together there's a soccer match that has been played and from that there were other truces that kind of happened and then there was a kind of a live and let live philosophy that started to uh uh develop they would do things like okay we're going to we're supposed to lob over so many artillery shows shells at a certain period of time. We're going to do it when we know you're not in the area and you'll do it when you know we're not in the area <laughs> cuz you know th- this is the 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 force influence at play was let's not kill each other. Let's try to avoid killing each other. So I want to throw in a little something. Uh at the beginning of this war, the common man didn't have his heart in it. Uh if you if you look at modern wars, uh, you always have a big giant propaganda build up to it. Not to mention the whole uh, public indoctrination thing that exists right now, to where here in the U.S. you can get a significant amount of the population to volunteer to go off and fight somebody just because they're told to. But in the in the First World War, uh, I, I, I was I recently listened to Prof. CJ's series on World War One again, and he pointed something out. In, in 1913, if you if an Englishman shot a German, he'd go to jail. But in 1914, if, he, if an Englishman shot a German, he'd get a medal. Mm-hmm. And back in those days, you didn't have passports and, and everything like it is now. Uh, people would go from country to country just like here in America. We go from state to state. People from Wisconsin go to go to Illinois or northern Michigan or Minnesota, whatever, and nobody thinks nothing of it. And that's how it was back then. As a matter of fact, there was uh, one account of during the Christmas truce, a German had worked in a restaurant in London. He was a chef, and he was out there there during one of these truces and he saw customers from the restaurant he used to work at wow that's <laughs> well and even that goes to the point of what i said where these guys were in close proximity with one another they were they were real to each other sometimes the the, the battle lines or the boundaries went through a building and you had two different countries militaries in the same building Guarding the line. Right. Yeah. It, it was a brutal affair. Now, the powers that be saw what was happening, and they were having some difficult time even getting them to go over the top. They didn't want to go. They didn't want to go kill these dudes. So what they did was they went through a process of restoring order. And, again, there's some conflicting reports about exactly what happened and the extent to uh, what happened. But uh, what we know is there were selective executions of, of soldier, almost like in the Roman model, the, the the practice of decimation and decimation is basically you're, you're killing one in 10. Now they didn't kill one in 10, but it's, it's still the idea that you're picking uh, a few of the people in 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 the regiment and you're killing them you're shooting them and you're sending a message to these guys you're using 
force influence to trigger an action in them, which is, listen, it's either you or them. And it's not them that's threatening you. It's your own government that's threatening you. And and it didn't work perfectly, but it you wouldn't see another Christmas truce, and they went over the top. Wherever they could, you would see them still try live and let live to some degree. But then what happens towards, you know, by 1916, what happens is because of the decisions that the leaders made where they decided to use more and more hideous practices like bombing civilians, using mustard gas, and uh, they they actually truly began to hate each other and they wanted to kill each other, <laughs> but it it wasn't it wasn't this group of people that had come to that it was decisions that they were forced to to act on by their leaders that produced this hatred and and this uh, animosity towards one another so in in, uh, in 1914 the christmas truce that was a moment that was a powerful moment where people they they kind of came to realize what the heck is all this about why are we doing this? There's, it doesn't serve any end. World War I, for anyone who studied it, you know, largely World War I was about saving face. Uh, you know, these, these, uh, these aristocrats, they, they, you know, they couldn't be indignified. They had to win. They had to show that they were the power, that they were the strength. Because was, there, was, there was no point to the frickin' war other than for the aristocrats. But the war went on because, because of force. Because of that, if, so if you look at how the aristocrats ultimately suffered out of that, uh, it certainly wasn't to their benefit, and it, it's it's very fair to say that they bit off more than they could chew, and it got way out of hand for them. And I here, here's one for you: the Bolshevik Revolution was a product of Germany putting. Lenin on a train and sending him back there to sow seeds of discord. Mm-hmm. It was and, to take Russia out of the war. Yeah, and it it took Russia out of the war and the, most of the 20th century. Be, well, let, let me qualify that a little bit. Any progress that could be made in Russia as far as developing a market and 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 a, an economy that could support the the people that live there went straight down straight down the drain. Generations of Russians murdered for no good reason whatsoever. Well, let me back up. There's no good reason to murder somebody. Um, lives were just wasted as if as if it was just scraps from a table. A lot of the, a lot of eggs, a lot of eggs were broken, and there wasn't a single damn omelet made. <laughs> now, the interesting thing, though, is that force influence in and of itself doesn't work in the long run. Even in Russia, uh, Stalin used the terror. He would literally send out uh, his henchmen into, he would pick a city, and he would target just at random, totally at random. It was intended to create total terror among the Russian people that you step out of line, you could die. And even if you don't step out of line, you could die. So... You you seriously, you you watch your p's and q's. I heard heard uh, or you, this. Or uh, you may as or you may as well step out of line because <laughs> you got just as much of a chance of of getting it if you don't step out of line. Right. So, <laughs> despite that, okay, Russia, the Soviet Union, force influence was was one of the major ways that they 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 sought to keep people where they wanted to keep people in this managed economy. It was it was a treasonous act to participate in the black market. When when the Soviet Union collapses in 1990 and I remember all the predictions they it collapsed like toward the beginning of winter. And the prediction was oh it's not going to survive the winter man. It's going to it's they're not going to their economies collapse. They're not going to survive the winter. They survived the winter. They they did fine. And the reason they did fine is because despite all the force efforts being applied, the black market was alive and well in 
the Soviet Union, in Russia. So when the Soviet economy collapsed, black market was there to save the day, as, as it will. It hadn't disappeared. It hadn't gone anywhere. They had, they had taken so much uh, effort to wipe out the Russian Orthodox Church. As soon as things start to relax, what emerges really, really quickly in Russia? Out in the open, the Russian Orthodox Church. There's just... It only takes you so far, but it's still, it's it's a powerful influence. But like in the 1381 example, the peasants had all the force power, all the force and influence, all on their side, and yet they were done in by ideational influence. So, so force in and of itself isn't going to save the day, but. If you're dealing with an enemy that isn't swayed, <laughs> that doesn't care about your ideas, and doesn't care about even your you know social and demonstrable influence, you're going to have a bad time. You may eventually overcome, but you're you're going to have a bad time. This is Michael Dean from the Freedom Fiends. I've run websites since 1996 and have used over a dozen web hosts in that time. Agoristhosting.com is the only one that hasn't broken my heart. Agrist Hosting's uptime and service is stellar, and their DDoS mitigation is the best I've seen. That's important because if you tell the truth in this world, you'll ruffle feathers. And some people will try dirty tricks to silence your voice. No matter what the haters hit us with, Agorist Hosting keeps our websites online. If you have a mission-critical commercial presence or a world-changing activism site, you cannot tolerate any skullduggery. So go with agoristhosting.com. Have a WordPress or blog site, but you're not satisfied with performance or uptime? Or just want raw hosting? Want to pay with Bitcoin? Agris Hosting specializes in high-performance hosting with personalized service. Go to agrishosting.com and click on the button that says Get Hosted. That's agrishosting.com. And then that takes us to the last one. I had this in a different order, but I, I switched it around because I thought we should end on this. And that is, are you ready? I'm ready. Demonstrable influence. <clears throat> so I gave as my example of demonstrable influence the Gutenberg printing press. So before the Guten Gutenberg printing press, Knowledge was in the hands of the elite, of the wealthy. And they had uh, let the peasants know that uh, that's the way it should be. And they spread the idea that, you know, you can't have, you can't have God's word in the minds and the mouths of untrained rabble. You could only have the most elite, the most divine, the most anointed actually looking at and sharing God's word with one another. And you can just that, that, that's not a new idea either. Uh, no. As a matter of fact, when, when, when Plato wrote about the Republic, that's exactly the same thing that he was describing. You couldn't have the rabble guiding themselves. You need an intellectual elite to tell them what to do and pay them for the service. And that is the Republic. Which is an art name for oligarchy, but anyway. So yeah. sorry, continue. <laughs> no, no, yeah, you're, and yeah, this, this, this kind of thinking still exists, but we're, we're just talking about in this area, you're going to see a shift, and the shift didn't come through ideational demands or social uh, influence uh, first. It came through demonstrable influence, and that was. The Gutenberg Press comes along, and all of a sudden, people can print books on their own. Not only books, but it's, it, I mean, uh, pamphlets. The, the, it, do, do, a, do a Google English pamphleteers uh, reformation and, and learn about the, the pamphleteer wars. It's fascinating stuff. Uh, but what the Gutenberg printing press demonstrated through its technology was that no no we can clearly see we can clearly demonstrate that knowledge well it, it actually doesn't have to be in the hands of the elite it doesn't have to be in the hands of the few i like uh, uh i mean the, the the big struggle was 
the idea that you would take the Bible and you would you would translate it into the common language. When and you know, obviously in England we're talking about the English language. So John Wycliffe, he created a translation of the New Testament. And uh he uh <laughs> Well, th- well, let's just say they didn't like it. But, you know, he would say that you know, the, the, the plowman, the English plowman of the time knew the Bible better than the priest did. I mean, these, they, these folks, they were hungry for this knowledge. And they could have access to it. That was the thing. They could suddenly have access to it. It was demonstrated to them that this ideology, this, this ideational influence of only the elite can have access to this special knowledge, it was a lie. The only reason they had special knowledge because freaking books were really expensive to print. You, yeah, it, it was you had to very write it scarce. Out. It was very scarce because back in back in that day, you had the scribes that their job was to take one book and copy it into another one. So you would take you would have one book and then you would have two books after that. And it, I, I wonder how much complaining there was about the the printing press putting all those scribes out of work. But there was uh, some. There was some yeah. actually. But there was. But, but that barrier to entry, it. it it was completely eliminated by the printing press, and if you look at the modern day with the uh, with the internet, it's it's literally teaching the slaves to read. As a matter of fact, that's an old school Freedom Fiends episode, teaching the slaves to read. And I don't, <laughs> I don't know think I've heard that one. It, it's very early on, very old school. You were you were still a status talk about my rule of law back then. I was probably anyway, a Christian conservative hardcore. Gotta gotta make sure George Bush gets real. Oh no no, gotta stop Obama. That's what it would have been. Chris, Christian conservative love thy neighbor as long as they're not from Mexico. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> yes, I had I yeah. was very much anti immigration back then. Yeah, but anyway, but uh, so but anyway, uh, I think you rem- you probably remember this a couple of years ago. Uh, John Kerry, who was the Secretary of State, says, "Yeah, the internet's making it very difficult for us to govern." <laughs> and you mean coerce is, people to think how you want them to think. Well, yeah, that too. We can't control the information. We need gatekeepers. You know, th- these people are thinking for themselves. They have access to information. And it's really a remake of the, the, the this modern time is really a remake of the uh the freedom that was created through the Gutenberg printing press. Except now you don't even have you only have the barrier of of entry of being able to buy books or only have access to what's available in your public library, you have access to so much information these days. You know, how to how to do this, how to do that, how to do a brake job on on a on a pickup truck, how to replace a garage door, how to how to build a freaking house from scratch. So what do they do to combat that, right? What they have been doing is they've been trying to flood you with useless information especially uh can i say the p word on radio uh depends on which p it is ends with an n fear i don't know porn yeah okay i can say i clearly i can say it so they fill you with fear porn they fill you with conspiracy theories they fill you with all kinds of uh rabbit trails that lead nowhere and but what they're finding i think is that okay that's working on a large portion of people but there's still a significant segment that actually seems to be gaining like useful uh uh dare i say it i'll just say it for lack of a better word liberty building knowledge that they're actually starting to apply so now now that's the time for them to come after social media and that's why you know i i track I look at 2,000 to 3,000 links a day as I call to find the stories that I'm going to cover on iState. And I can see the trends going on worldwide. And one of the biggest trends is so many nations are are trying to grapple. How do they rein in social media? Germany's figured out one way. They've passed legislation that 
if Facebook shares certain types of if certain types of information is shared on Facebook, even if face you know Facebook didn't do it, it's their users, then Facebook is legally liable, like really, like millions of dollars of fines worth of li liability. So they're trying to create laws that are literally price social media uh, out of the marketplace because because it's it, not quite working. It sounds like the ban on subversive li literature in East Germany and the Soviet Union back in the old Cold War days, and they they banned they banned it hard. I mean, they 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 banned it harder than that than you could even imagine. It was still readily available, and it it'll still be readily available. Uh, it, but but they've replaced subversive literature, decadent literature, uh, whatever old words they used to do now the new word is fake news whenever you hear a government official talking about fake news just replace it with censorship i want to censor you that's it we got to we we have to prevent the dissemination of fake news we we have to censor people that's that's <laughs> so, that's all that shut, means are they going to shut down the white house press room because that's where a lot of it comes from well it that's, comes that from the white the house that is the biggest purveyor of fake news out there. Always has been. I, I'm not sure about that right now. I, I I think the White House press room has a lot of fake news coming out of it. I also think the Democrat National Convention headquarters has a lot of fake news coming out of it. Fox News has a lot of fake news coming out of it. CNN, you know, they're they're <laughs> the RNC they're, headquarters. The RNC headquarters. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of folks out there with the a lot of fake news uh, going out there. And then there actually is like the trolley fake news sites. But uh, I, I'd i rather... I love those. I, they're great. But I would rather... I would rather learn how to discipline myself. And I want to do that on one of our Is Daily Thursday shows. still want to do that. We didn't get to it tonight. But I, I, I would rather help people see how to look at the news, news in a critical way. You, you can actually still get useful information from CNN and Fox News. You can. Uh, but you're going to have to navigate through the garbage, through the propaganda that, that, that's mixed in there. But you can get, like news, I did a story, uh, a CNN story. It was about technology. Nothing wrong with that story. So <laughs> you can get, you can get, good information from these places you just you just have to watch for certain things and uh i would rather see that happen obviously than the government step in and they're going to somehow teach you to well they're not going to teach you they're just going to they're going to prevent you from having to con confront bad things they're going to protect you from yourself it's, it's not a battle against fake news either it's it's a battle against the un uh unapproved fake news well that's it it's it's on you you look at like i see how the democrat the left is being pulled along to support censorship and how the right is being pulled along to support censorship so for the left it's the russians with the fake news that destroyed the Hillary campaign. And we have to do something about this. We have to monitor social media to assure that this doesn't happen again. And they're the left. They, they were, they were at one time, they were ostensibly, you know, free speech and all that. Now all of a sudden they're, they're begging for government censorship. But on the other side, now that the Republicans apparently, now they've picked up the mantle of free speech and I could tell you why that is. I don't know if we can get to that because we're just about out of time. But the Republicans, they're being pulled into the censorship because these these social media giants, they're unfair to conservatives. They're 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 targeting conservatives way more than they're targeting progressives. They're kicking, you know, Sargon of Akkad just just today's a story out where Google has suspended his uh, Google account. And so the answer from the Republicans is antitrust. We've got to bust these companies up. In other words, it's a form of censorship. We have to destroy these, these, these platforms of information because they're not you know, working against us. And 
Can I say real quick why it is that the Republicans are suddenly free speech? Oh, please do. I might not believe you, but go ahead and say it. Ostensibly free speech. The reason the Republicans are ostensibly free speechers now is because they come from a place of weakness and free speech protects them. Whereas the progressives, they don't need free speech because they're the ones that have the gateways to power as far as uh, uh, really uh, 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 cultural influence. It's, uh, it's social, it's ideational, it's even to some degree demonstrable. Uh, they have all, they control all the major gateways of all the major cultural institutions in America today. So they don't need free speech because the institutions are on their side and they know they're not going to be the target. The Republicans are going to be the target because they don't control the, the, the major cultural gateways. So suddenly they're for free speech. I remember back in the early 80s. It was the Democrats who were usually the ones crying out for free speech. And it was the Republicans that were fighting, you know, for security and, you know, you, you got to fight the terrorists, whatever. And, and now it's switched. Got to fight them the, Ruskies. Because the balance of power has switched in that area. So that's why the Republicans are now free speechers and the progressives are no longer interested in free speech because they don't need it. Free speech is, is not an ideal. It's a weapon. I do want to correct you on one thing. Uh, many of the Republicans are pre progressives, too. So make oh, sure yeah. that you get that correct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm using their terms. By, but from the way you and I look at them, they're all progressives. They're all leftists. <laughs> status leftists. They're all status leftists. So, yeah. So, yeah, I'm absolutely, I'm just using their their markers, their identities. They all have... You know, basically, they have different winners and losers. That's it. They have different winners and losers. And I think I hear the music. I think we're just about out of time. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on, Paul. It's, it's, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, they can, Everybody can find you at iState.tv. And for more Freedom Fiends, go to FreedomFiends.com. Worms. That's worms. Worms and salutations. Can I say that? Worms and salutations? Yes. We got like 30 seconds. <laughs> worms, worms, worms. Salutations, salutations, Let's do that salutations. for 30 more seconds. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I love the Freedom Fiends, so I, I was very happy to be on. We're out. And we're out. The Central Scrutinizer is a Soviet-style leviathan trying to keep track of all you do. That's why I use a VPN or virtual private network from Bola VPN. Bola VPN is inexpensive, secure, and will allow you to use your computer without leaving a trail. Bola VPN is now also offering torrent seed boxes for safely sharing media with the world. And if you open a support ticket saying you heard about them from the Freedom Fiends, they'll add three extra days free. That's Bola VPN at B-O-L-E-H-V-P-N dot net.